And once again, I want to say good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. I truly, truly appreciate it. You know, um, one of the things we we do here at Right Way Options and Run Candlesticks, we we really want to help traders with their trading. And so tonight's class being a little bit different, it's not one of those sexy classes where we look at a lot of charts and a lot of great patterns and, you know, the indicators and all those kind of things. This is going to be really more directed to the the rules of trading and some of the concepts to help you develop that set of rules for yourself now this was a requested class <clears throat> i had someone that sent me a request to to kind of you know talk about rules and some of my rules and and what we're going to do uh, and how how i do the things i do and why i do the things i do and we'll go through some of those things as we go along here so Anybody ever heard of Jesse Livermore? If you're if you've been trading any time at all, you've run across a Jesse Livermore um, quote or book or or read about him in some way, shape, or form. He was actually kind of an odd dude. Okay, I think that's that's fair to say he was kind of an odd dude, but he had a lot of really great ideas about trading and this is one of his quotes wishful thinking must be banished you know one of the things we do as traders is we always we come to the market with a lot of different misconceptions we think the market is that that place where we can get rich quick easy it's that place where you know there's just so much money there i have to be able to make money there we can we come to it with a lot of different um, things and a different reasons why we come to it. And <clears throat> oftentimes the market teaches us that our thinking about the market is wrong. And even though we have these big wishful thinking ideas on how we're going to get rich and things like that, we've taken a class and so now we know everything there is to know about the market. The market genuine, I mean, uh, generally teaches us very quickly that we do not. And we have to come to grips with certain aspects of trading that requires us to be very, very serious about planning. And Jesse Livermore, I think, kind of hit that, you know, boom, hit that right on the head. Wishful thinking must be banished. <clears throat> trading is not like any other thing that you've ever done. You know, a lot of us, we, we go out in the world, we get that job, we work for a company, we um, start our own business, whatever it is we do. And <clears throat> we have the ability to build this fence around us to protect us from our own, shall I say, weaknesses. We, we, we fence ourselves into a place where we, it's our little niche, it's our place in the world. The thing about trading is it, you, there's, there's no barriers. There's, it, it, would you guys agree, anyone that's been around trading very long, would you guys agree that trading will expose, will shine a light on every single issue that you have when it comes to trading it will point it out to you and it'll usually point it out to you in a relatively painful way because we cannot put those barriers around us or we can't have someone else protecting us like we do at a job or a business where where your boss says, well, you're really good at this. We're going to have you do that and we're going to have someone else take care of this because not so much, right? We don't get those little barriers that help us be successful in other things. The market breaks all of those down. There's no protection. We either have to face it and we have to step up to it or the market will find that weakness and expose it for us. Okay, so I'm gonna jump right into here. Um, 
Rule number one is pretty simple. You have to have a trading plan. Now, we, we tend to see folks talk about this a lot. And I hear people give this lip service a lot. Yeah, I have a plan. Okay. All right. Tell me about your plan. Well, my plan is to make money. That's not a plan. That is a desire, maybe even a fantasy. But that's not a plan. And we cannot treat trading in such a cavalier manner. You see, if we trade outside of a uh, side of a plan, um, even if they are winners, it's considered undisciplined trading. Okay, trading requires a specific amount of discipline, where you adhere to a set of rules, a plan. Okay, and if you don't do that, you're breaking your own discipline. You see, one of the reasons we put together a plan, you know, say for example, we talk about, and you guys see me draw this up all the time. It's nothing more than we see a trending stock. We look for a stock that moves up, pulls back. We wait for the entry. We look for a stock that moves up or goes sideways and we wait for the entry. Why do we do that? We do that because we know that these price patterns have a expectancy built into them. We know that trending stocks tend to stay in a trend until the trend breaks. We know that these price patterns repeat themselves over and over in the market. It's very, very common, right? In the market. So if we build a plan around an expectancy of patterns or, or the process that we want to follow in our trading, and then we don't follow it. And here's the funny thing is we'll pat ourselves on the back when we break those rules and it pays off. Right? How many has ever done that? Hey, I must be some kind of genius, man. See how I pick that bottom? I am a genius. And then the next five times that you try that, the market reminds you that you're not in a very harsh way. So if we break our own plan, if we break our own rules, or we don't live within a plan that has an expectancy of results, we run into all the problems that people face day after day after day in trading. Okay. And like I said, this isn't really that sexy subject. This is one of those things where I'm going to force you guys to kind of, at least that's my, my hope here is to force you to look within a little bit. Okay. To step up, fess up, to your trading. Oftentimes when people hire me to work with them individually as a trader, we take a look at past trades. We take a look at what their trading expectancy is. And that's a difficult thing to share with someone else, right? Because it exposes us to our failures. No one wants, no one wants to feel like a failure. No one wants to have to face that. But as traders, we must face that. If you don't face it, if you lie to yourself, then I'm doing great. You tell all your friends and puff out your chest. Oh my, what do you do? Well, I'm a trader. Really? Oh yeah, man, this is, this is something else. This, you got to see this stuff. This is, this is incredible. And you convince yourself that you're doing great when you're not. You convince yourself, your spouse, you don't even tell your spouse about your losses. Because you don't want to fess up to the problems that are creating these issues. It's hard. It's hard to face that. It's always hard to look at that person in the mirror and say, look, pal, 
you're messing this up. It's on you because you're the traitor. There's nobody to blame but you. And here's one of the bigger problems that I see with people. They don't treat their trading as a business. Okay? I, I hear people say, well, trading is a hobby. It's just a hobby for me. No, it is not. It will turn out to be one of the most expensive hobbies you've ever had if you don't start treating it like a business. Even if you do it part time. Let's think about the, the requirements in, in trading. You know, there's expenses, losses, taxes that you have to pay, plenty of uncertainty, and there's risk required. They call that business. And if you don't treat your trading like a business, you're going to end up learning a very painful lesson that you cannot just do this halfway. You can't just lazy your way into success in trading. It's not the way it works. <clears throat> well, one thing, CJ, treating it like a business, having a trading plan. When you walk into any bank as a, and you have a business idea and you walk in, the business, the bank that you're trying to get financing from is going to require a business plan. Not how you feel or think you can get a profit so that they can be paid back, but how you will do that. The process you're going to follow and some proof that that model actually works. Otherwise, they send you packing. Who's going to loan you money if you just say, well, I just want to make money? Well, duh. So does everyone else. If you're going to get into the business of trading, you have to put it together as a business. There's expenses that have to be covered. There's education that is required. There's a set of, there's equipment that needs to be purchased. There's things that make this a business. And so we have to treat it as such. We have to have a plan. We need to write down information. You know, one of the things that's kind of weird about Ed and I, <clears throat> we've actually never, ever been in the same room together. But that's not the weird thing. The weird thing is even though we've never, ever been in the same room together, we have such similar thoughts on trading and trade planning and, and the proof of the business that we actually went to the extent of building spreadsheets and proving certainty of certain patterns and looking at ratios and wondering which trade pattern worked better than the others and what strategy was working better than this one and what this candle was doing compared to this one. We looked at all of that stuff. We've got piles and piles of data on it. It's okay, you can call us both nerds. <clears throat> I say it all the time, I'm nothing more than a big chart nerd. Okay? But because of that, we learned about ourselves. We learned about our trading. We learned about building a plan with a set of expectancies that have a high probability of winning. Not a certainty, but a high probability. We know what doesn't work for us as well. <clears throat> How many of you don't know what's working for you? You see the losses and you beat yourself up for the losses, but have you ever studied to figure out why you're losing? That's what you do in a business. In a business, if something's not selling, if something's not moving, if you can't if you can't move this product, if you can't build this product, you study the problem and try and figure out why and fix it. 
But in trading, we take the losses and go, man, stupid president, if he had just shut his mouth or didn't send out that tweet, I would have made money. No, that's not the case. <clears throat> we have to learn from our mistakes and fess up to our mistakes and work to find solutions and build rules and guidelines around it to protect us from us. Okay, and that's what I mean by treating it like a business. You are the CEO of the business, okay? And as the CEO of the business, your job, I say this all the time, is to protect your trading capital. But I think people take that incorrectly. They mistake protecting your trading capital as not losing money, and that's not what I'm saying at all. <clears throat> we all know trading, there's going to be an expectancy of losing trades. We know that's going to happen. It's a part of business. You're going to have losing trades. There's no way to avoid it, but we can do everything. We have to do everything we can to minimize it. And that requires us fessing up to the losing trade, studying it, figuring out what we did wrong, studying how we can repair that situation, find out what works, find out what doesn't work. Okay? And we're all different. That's the hard part about trading. Each and every one of us is different. <clears throat> We have different sized accounts. We have different experiences with m money. We have different financial backgrounds as far as uh, uh, um, our relationship to money, our knowledge about money. And we have different ways that we see and view a chart. I may look at a chart and see a specific pattern and everyone else goes, what the heck is that guy looking at? Okay, we all are individuals and that means we have to have an individual plan. We have to have that plan that fits us. And here's the, here's the thing that just sucks for most people because they don't want to hear this. That doesn't happen overnight. It took years for Ed to go through all of that, all of that information, to ferret out what worked and what didn't for him, it took years for me. Now it doesn't have to take years. You can borrow from people like Ed or myself, learn from the, our mistakes, because we openly share that, and prevent yourself from going through years and years. You can collapse that time frame dramatically. But that's only going to work if you fast up to the mistakes, evaluate, figure out what went wrong, and make your own personal rule to prevent it from happening again. Okay? So protecting your capital means <clears throat> or is not necessarily anything about protecting your money, okay? It's about properly managing the risk of your business. Our business is our livelihood. We must protect it. These people that you see in Facebook and all these places, and they're out there shotgunning. They're just puffing out their, oh, they're the greatest traders in the world. They do, but there's no proof. They don't stand in front of somebody and say, hey, guys, here's a trade that we're taking like we do here. Here's a trade we're taking. We put it out there ahead of time. We talk our talk. We don't play that game. We fess up when we've made a mistake. Okay? And that is a big part of developing that trading plan for yourself. <clears throat> 
build your trading plan based on facts everybody remember dragnet just the facts ma'am <clears throat> we need facts not the warm and fuzzies not going to a webinar and hearing about the newest flashbang indicator out there that's supposed to be the greatest thing in the world but there's no facts there's no proof and you got that right al <laughs> there's no proof <clears throat> so how do we go about building that proof and that's the same proof with me i mean you've got to build that proof right i tell you this pattern has a high expectancy or wins commonly you have to go out and have that expectancy <clears throat> or, or, or work for the, the proof of that expectancy. Because if you don't believe it, if you don't see it, you can't trade it. We see this all the time with members of hit run candlesticks and right way options. I'll make a mention, hey, we're up 25% in this trade. And somebody says, well, I'm only up 10%. Or somebody says, you know, I lost money. What did you guys do differently? Well, when did you enter? Well, I waited for three more days to get in the trade because I was nervous and scared about the position. All right. You think that might have an impact on the outcome of the trade? See, you have to build in yourself that set of rules and guidelines that gives you that expectancy that this trade, this setup will work. Okay, and here's the thing that Ed and I do, <laughs> did, still do, is we test and evaluate, and we test and evaluate, and we test and evaluate. And then what we do from that information is we do more of what works and less of what doesn't. Now that just seems real simplistic, right? But it's not because you have to learn what works for you and learn that learn the failings that you have on trading. How many in here would admit that you've traded emotionally? How many of you in here would admit you've chased a trade? How many of you in here would, would admit that you're impatient? How many of you in here would admit that you've traded without a stop loss? How many of you here would admit that you have taken a big loss but not accepted it? How many of you here would admit that you've repeated the same mistake over and over and over and not made a change? See, you're the CEO of your business. Okay? And if you don't fess up to the results of your business, who's going to? How's it going to improve? If you don't do the effort to improve it. Okay? Now, I put this in here, always use a stop loss. And to me, this is an obvious thing because it should be that right there. Always use a stop loss, stop loss and the tagline underneath, enough said. What was one of the rules that, that we just talked about? Treat your trading as a business. How can you manage your business with an unlimited risk trade where you don't know where you're going to get out, where you don't know how much risk you're taking because you chased or rushed in, you got all emotional and jumped into something that you weren't sure about. Oh my gosh, I'm missing out. Is that good business management? How many think that if you were an employee of my business, or Ed's business, 
and you knew this rule and you continuously broke that rule with some kind of an excuse. Well, I didn't have time to do that. I was so, everything was moving so fast. I didn't have time for that. How many think you'd still have a job? Right? And if you're not being that tough boss, holding yourself accountable to a set of rules, who's going to do it for you? How is it going to get better if you don't hold yourself accountable? Now, how many in here thinks it's a really good idea to just take trades and not understand the risk to your business? How many of you think that makes some sense? How many think you could go into a bank and say, you know what, I need to borrow $20,000 for my business startup here. And you tell them something like that. Well, it's just an unlimited risk thing. We're going to make all kinds of money. We're, we're pretty sure of it. How many think you're going to walk out of there with any money in your hand? How many of you think might be laughing behind you as you do walk out the door? So why is it we step into a trading business and we think we can just do whatever the heck we want? We don't have to treat it like a business. We don't have to plan a trade. We don't have, don't bother me with that baloney. Just tell me how to make money. Guys, I'm telling you how to make money. It's right here. This is how you make money. You build a plan with high expectancy and you become disciplined to the rules. How many thinks trading that the stock market rewards laziness? Oh, sure. Every once in a while you hear about some kid that went in the market at 21 and with his bar mitzvah money and he became a millionaire in 18 months. All right. Then I will show you a trader that threw everything in all at once and got lucky. And none of us in here would do that with our money. The money that we live on and support our families on. We wouldn't do that. Not a chance in the world we wouldn't do that. So it doesn't match us. Right? Can you get rich quick overnight? Yes. Throw it all in, guys, and throw the and roll the dice. Can you get rich quick? Sure. What do you think the chances you get poor more times than rich? Do you think the market is set up to just make you instantly rich because you want it? If it were that easy, everyone would do it, and then there would be no money in it. You cannot be lazy or cavalier about your plan and building that plan of expectancy in your trading. Okay. This is another big one. <clears throat> and, and I'm seeing it in the market right now. How many of you would like to go back three weeks and just have the money back? that you lost over the last three weeks to this market. You don't have to answer to the room, answer to yourself. How many would just love to have that back? See, a big part of trading is knowing when you don't have an edge in the market. When the risk isn't worth the potential reward. When you have to learn to say, look, okay, the market's open, I'm open and I'm sitting here. But that doesn't mean you have to trade. 
No one is forcing you to make that decision to, to click that button. But we do it to ourselves all the time, right? We let the pressure of that market, oh my gosh, I'm doing, I got to do something. Not making any money this week. I got to do something only to make the problem worse. Right? Does it improve our situation if we force or push trades when we don't have an edge just so that we can be busy only to make our situation worse, only to decrease our account? How productive is that? <clears throat> what kind of business plan allows you to just at times, well, we're just going to, you know, <clears throat> At times, we're just going to throw money out the window because, doggone it, we made so much last quarter, we might as well just toss money out the window. We got nothing else to do. What? You got to know when to back off. When the market is providing you with not clear signals in trading, we have to know it's time to protect our business. Is our business going to be improved if over the next three months we lose so much money that we cannot trade the three months after that when the market recovers? I'm here. I'm with you there, Ed. It took me forever to learn that. That there are times that protecting my business is far more important than the need to be in the market when I don't have an edge. Activity does not equal results. And always remember, trading is a business. It should not be an addiction. Just because the market's open doesn't mean you have to put money at risk. You have to put money at risk as the head of the business. You have to look at that market and say, is the risk today worth it? Is my expectancy good? And if it's not, you have to be the one disciplined to say, it's time to stand aside. Well, think Newton, have you ever had a period of the a period of, while you were trading when the majority of your trades just work? Things were just going along, you were making money pretty consistently. You had some losses in there, but it was just kind of, things were working. Okay, yes, a bull market. What are we in right now, Newton? Sideways, you see this market as sideways? Yeah, it's down or correction territory. Downtrend. There you go. So how have you done in correction markets or downtrending markets? How is that? How, how was that proof to you over your period of trading? How have you done during those markets? Did you make money? Okay. So wouldn't it be fair to say that in a bullish market, you have a better edge than you have in a bearish market. Your win-loss ratio improves. Your edge increases. Your win-loss expectancy is stronger. And here's the double edge of that that's really harmful to traders.
Because we don't learn this lesson, we continue to trade in a bad market. What happens to your confidence? The confidence that your trade plan has any validity at all. If we just break our trade plan and trade whenever we want, without any expectancy of win or without any discipline to a set of rules, what happens? We lose our money back to the market and our confidence collapses. Almost to the point that we get so, so withdrawn with what we do, we, we can no longer trade. We are physically frozen in a position. How many have ever been in a losing trade and be so frozen, you're watching it fall and you can't even close it? You're sitting there, you're looking at it, you're staring at it. And you're incapable of doing anything about it. Okay. That occurs because we're not, first, we may not have a plan. Second, we're not being disciplined to our plan. Our, our plan says that should never happen, right? Yes, we have gap downs overnight. We can't control that. But we should have that stop loss in and take that trade off. We were wrong. Admit it. Be gone. But without a plan, without a stop loss, we sit there and we watch that trade get worse and worse and worse and worse. Because we didn't do our job initially of following a trade plan and staying disciplined to the rules, protecting our business. How long are we going to be in business if we continue to do that? Not very long. People want to think that their trading has everything to do with, well, it's that perfect entry signal. It's that perfect chart pattern. It's that perfect candle pattern. That's what makes you a great trader. And all of this planning, none of that means anything. That's what, I'm telling you guys, this is the most important part of your trading. If you don't build a plan, have a set of rules, hold yourself accountable to those rules, treat your trading as a business, Fess up to your mistakes, evaluate, work to improve by evaluation of yourself and your training to raise your expectancy of wins. If you don't do those things, doesn't matter how many candle patterns you know, it doesn't matter what pattern you have, doesn't matter what combination of indicators that you think is the greatest thing in the world, you are going to lose money. Because you have no discipline in the market. Okay. Confront your worst enemy, and that enemy is you. Here's another quote of Jesse Livermore that I just think is great. The human side of every person is the greatest enemy of the average investor or speculator. We are our own worst enemy. Because we don't want to confront ourselves with those hard questions. We don't want to admit failure. We don't want to expose ourselves to that pain. And so we put up barriers. Well, I, yeah, I'm still, do, I'm doing great. All is well. My account, my account's get, I'm getting killed. If I tell my wife, she's going to kick me out of the house, but I'm doing great.
we all have to fess up to our limitations and we all have limitations. We all have fear. But if we don't face those fears, if we don't face those limitations and create rules and guidelines to protect us from ourselves, we're not doing our business any favors. You're likely to be out of business. Does that make sense, guys? I know this stuff sounds harsh, and it's not that I'm trying to be mean at all. I'm, I, I truly believe this stuff, and it, if you guys see the the way I trade you know that it's true that I follow a set of rules there's times when I don't trade where I do what I think is the most thing better most important thing to do and that's protect my business so that I can trade another day when the odds are in my favor okay need to keep things into perspective one of the things that I deal with a lot in coaching is that we think this whole idea of goal setting is just you know amateur hour you know that's not really for me that's you know okay so the big corporations they have goals and they have plans and stuff like that but that's not for me okay guys we're competing with the institutions every time you're in the market you're in competition with Goldman Sachs Do you think you are in good position to just willy-nilly jump in there without any kind of focus or plan and think that Goldman Sachs is going to care whether you lose your, their, your money to them? They don't care. That's what they're there for. They want to just, you know, turn on that vacuum cleaner and ho suck that money right out of your pocket if they can. Oh, thank you very much. So if we come to the market with the idea that we can just be cavalier about it, that we can puff out our chest and say, you know what, I'm just going to trade this whole, I don't have to do all that other stuff. How long do you think that's going to work? You may get lucky once, twice, a few times. But eventually it's going to drain your account. Think about walking a path. And this is the way I think about my trading. You guys hear me say, um, I'm always trying to figure out that path from point A to point B. And this really came from my building background, okay? When someone handed me a, a set of plans to build um, an apartment complex, if I looked at that and tried to analyze everything of that project in totality, I would have gone absolutely insane. No one can do that. And so what you have to do is start breaking it down to pieces at a time, setting these achievable goals. One thing leads to the next. You're walking this path to where you want to go. A winning trade moves you forward in that path. A losing trade makes you step back. Okay. I'm building that apartment complex. One of my employees makes a mistake. Reads the plan wrong. And we have to take a day's worth of work. Tear it back down because it's not right. That's a step back. Okay, but what do we do? We figure out where the problem occurred. As a good business manager, I find out where the problem occurred. Might have been my fault. And make sure that that never happens again. Okay. We chase a trade and we lose money and we step back. What do we do? 
we write a rule. I will no longer chase trades. I won't do it anymore. You can't make me do it anymore. I will not do it anymore. No matter how great the market looks this morning, no matter what they said on CNBC, no matter how much hype there is out there, I will not chase a trade. I will follow my rules. That prevents that step back from occurring the next time. so that you can keep moving down this pathway, reaching those goals to your final destination where you want to be. But if you're constantly wishy-washy, if you're constantly jumping off a plan, you're not on the path. You're not on a path to success anyway. You're on a path that's going to lead you to, you know, the poorhouse. Okay. We have to do a better job. And people with small accounts, I get this all the time. Yeah, but I've only got a $10,000 account. I don't need to do all this. No, you really need to do this. A person with a small account has less flexibility. They must be diligent. Too much give back and we're in real trouble. Okay. Robert, my rule, the rule that we have talked about and talked about and talked about ed talks about and talks about and talks about it doesn't matter whether it's a stock trade an option trade a futures trade a currency trade whatever it is that you're trading never trade more than three to four percent of your account in any one single trade and i almost always fall to the lower around three percent I have to be really, really confident in the market and confident in a trade to risk more than 4% of my account into any one trade. And that's the trade size, not the risk to the stop loss. That is the trade size. because I've proven that I can recover from those things. When those events in the market, and we have those events, right? Chad mentions flash crash, where we have an event that we're in five, six, seven trades and they all stop out one day. Biggest, biggest one day loss we've had in forever. But those things happen, right? If we overtrade our account, we have almost an impossible chance of recovering from that loss. But if we trade small, doing the job of the business owner, managing how much risk we put out there for our company, not overreaching, not overstretching, not being stupid, we can recover from those things, unforeseen things, things that we can't plan for because they happen to us, right? There's nothing we can do about those. The only way we can manage that problem is to manage the risk that we put in the market on any single trade. Okay, so I'm not going to get into that. That's not the purpose of this, but you guys know the rule, three to 4% of your account maximum. NB, I just said, that is the size of your trade, not the percentage risked, the size of your trade. If you have a $20,000 account, what does that mean? You can trade a $600 position, no more.
The risk is your risk tolerance. We're going to get to that here in just a minute. Your tolerance to risk. And we talked about this today, NB. You've got to know what your risk tolerance is. If you don't know what your risk tolerance is, how are you going to manage your business? Oh, that's not true, Oleg. I trade stocks. But if you have a very small account, that may be true. But did anyone ever tell you you can trade 10 shares at a time? I did that for a long time. I started, I opened an account with 2500 bucks, And I only traded stocks. Rarely do I have more than half of my account in the market. That's correct. On swing trades or individual trades. Rarely. That's why I talk about position trading and having some of those longer term, not long term, but longer term positions that doesn't require all that micromanagement to use more of my capital. You guys heard me talk about them. I'm in the AMD. I'm up 60% in AMD. I have January 2020 calls. Everyone knows that. They know when I traded it. They know how I've managed it because I share every trade. Everyone knows that I'm in Walmart. I've been in Walmart now for a few years. It's a stock trade. I was in, I want to say, somewhere in the low, uh, upper 70s. It's now above 100. Don't make excuses, Oleg, that I can't do that, that this can't be right, because it is. If your account is really small, if you have a very small account, Oleg, then what should be part of your trading goals? Part of your business is to raise or grow more capital. Are you going to do that by risking it all on one trade? Are you telling me that that's what you think is the right thing to do? Don't make excuses. You are the CEO. Follow a rule or not. You know, that's up to you. Okay. That is up to you. Okay. Use technology to your advantage and take the time to learn how to use it. This is something that drives me crazy. <clears throat> when you go into business, any kind of business, If I showed up on the job site and didn't know how to use the skill saw or the chop saw or the laser level or something like that, who's that? Whose fault is that? Whose problem is that? Is it the problem of the guy at the store that sold me that piece of crap that I can't figure out how to use? That's not his problem. It's my problem. Just because it's hard doesn't mean that I should shrink away from it and not do it.
we have to learn the tools of the trade. Guys, if you don't know how to use the tools, what are you doing? How can you have an edge if you don't know how to use brokerage orders? How can you have an edge if you don't understand how to use your charting software? And as the CEO of the business, if you were working for me and you just kept bringing up, the, well, I don't know how to do that. Okay, you're fired. I can fix that problem. This guy over here wants to learn how to do that. I had to learn it. I had to sit in front of the computer hour after hour watching those boring videos and then practicing it. But why would you go to the market and not understand the tools that you're supposed to use to be successful? It makes no sense at all. Take the time to learn the tools. You know, in my construction business, I didn't care if a person had 20 years of experience. I, don't, I didn't care if that, that guy that I just hired that came onto my job site for his first day told me he'd been using a skill saw since he was five years old. He stepped onto my job site. He went through a class on how I expected him to use it. And he knew without a doubt, if he didn't use it that way, today would be his last day on the job. Because I was not going to have someone on my crew cut fingers off or hurt someone else on the crew. Because they developed a bad habit that this is the way I do it. I don't care how you did it before. This is how you do it now. Learn the tools. Okay? or you're just asking for trouble. If you're unwilling to do the simple stuff of learning how to use the true tools, how are you going to face the tough stuff that's gonna challenge you personally? Okay. And I went through all of that, and now people are thinking, oh my gosh, I have to have a book full of rules. No, you don't. Keep it simple. You know what things are causing you problems in your trading. You're rushing into trades. You're chasing a trade. You have no patience to set and wait for the entry. You have to hold yourself accountable to fix those problems because no one else will do it for you. You have to do that. Okay. Doesn't have to be super complex. It doesn't have to be multi spreadsheets. It can be on one piece of paper, what you will and what you won't do. And you have to follow up and evaluate yourself that you're following those rules. Okay. You guys have seen this before. This is in one of my, in my consistent profits eBooks. These are some of my basic rules and why I'm so anal about trading. I try to always trade in direction of the overall market. 
I only trade stocks moving with the overall market. I do not want to counter trend trade. I made a decision a long time ago. It's so much easier to just go with the market than it is to fight the direction. I'm not big enough to do that. I found out that I lose money when I do that. So I only want to move with the market. I only buy stocks that are at or near price support with a buy signal. The with a buy signal came later. Early on when I wrote this out, I was going to go long stocks at or near price support. I tried to anticipate the entry. Trying to guess when it was going to bounce. Oh, it's getting close to the 50 day moving average. It's going to bounce there. Wrong. I wait for proof that buyers are stepping in, showing me that price support. I don't try to catch the bottom or the tops. And that's really what this means overall. I'm not trying to pick the bottom. I don't have any desire to pick the bottom. I want somebody else to pick the bottom, namely the institutions, to decide when a stock is done going down, and then I wait for the entry signal. That's their job. My job is not to pick it or predict it. My job is simply to follow it when it starts to move. Okay, I sell stocks or I go short stocks that are at or near price resistance. Okay, now let's talk about this rule here for a second and break this rule down just a little bit. What does that mean? Well, for me, what it means is that when I'm in a winning trade, I don't try, I don't even want to try to squeeze every single penny out of the trade. I have a goal, a trade plan. This is what I am trying to achieve. Based on the plan when I entered the trade. Not after I entered the trade, not after greed sets in, now I just want more. How many's ever done that? Been in a trade, you're at 500 bucks in the trade. And then you stare at that chart all day long and the chart just steadily moves lower. And now it's $350, but doggone it, you don't sell it because I want $500, I saw 500. Just give me that $500 back. Come on, come on, give it back. How many have ever taken a trade like that and ended up, ended up taking it off when it was finally a loss because you're trying to get that $500 that was never yours to begin with because you didn't take the profit? And it may not be $500. It may be 100 bucks that you've done that. I hear that, Chad. That's painful, isn't it? That's right. Jesse Livermore. No wishful thinking. So you have a plan. The stock moves up toward resistance. What are we going to do? Take profits. Doesn't mean you have to take all the profits. I size my trade. Can I make my trade goal up there? If I have a trade goal of say I want to make $500 on a trade, if I can't size my trade for my risk tolerance on this position, then I don't take that trade. Everyone knows in right way options, I am extremely picky about the trades I take for a reason. Because I know I can trade less and make more than a lot of other people because I follow my rules. I put the edge in my favor when I trade. That's when I take a risk. Not just because I'm bored today and I need something to do. Okay, so I have a plan on where I'm going to take profits. 
and a goal in mind of what I'm trying to achieve on that trade. That's why I have no problem, and you guys have seen me do it. Right way options folks have seen me do it a lot. Stock is moving up and still going up, and I'm selling. How many in right way options have you even heard me say before the market even opens, hey, this stock's going to gap up. It's not where I hoped it would go, but I'm not going to risk this gap up. I'm going to take the profit at the open. I don't even care if it goes up beyond it the rest of the day. Market opens, I sell it. I'm out. I'm done. I hold to my plan. Because I hold myself accountable. Okay? I never, ever enter a trade without a plan to exit. Never. I always have an exit plan. If I'm wrong, I am out. I know what my risk is before I enter the trade. This is where I don't use a percentage. And I gave an example of this today. If you run, if you write down um, on a sheet of paper, I want you to write that down. Write down a hundred bucks. Can you lose a hundred bucks on a trade and it doesn't break a sweat? No problem. I mean, obviously we don't like it, but what I'm talking about won't hurt you, won't damage your sight and will damage you psychologically, won't make you think that, geez, I just suck as a trader. Um, it's just one of those things that happens. It's a risk I'm willing to take. Well, if you can say that about that hundred dollars, then your risk tolerance is at least a hundred dollars. What a it, write down a hundred and fifty. Can you say the same thing about $150? Here's the thing that I see 99% of the time when people share with me their bad trades. They didn't know what their risk was to start out with. They didn't know how much risk that they had in the trade from the beginning. So how could they properly manage their business? It's impossible. Yeah, for me, if a stock gaps in my direction, if I buy a stock and the next day it gaps up, I'm usually out. I just say, hey, thank you for the gift. I'll wait for the next entry into the trade. I'm gone. Because doesn't a gap in a stock increase the risk to your stop loss? How many times have we seen lately that the market gaps up and then sells off the rest of the day? So if the stock gaps in my direction, I usually just close the trade. And then I wait. I keep it on the list. I'm not done with the stock. I'll just wait for the next entry in the trade. Okay. So always have an exit plan. Always know the exact amount of money at risk. A lot of people ask me, how much percentage do you risk on a trade? Well, a percentage that you risk on a $5 trade is going to be way different than a percentage you would risk on a $150 trade. Okay. There's no true perfect percentage on how much you risk on a trade. You have to think about that dollar amount because as you know, you can't go to your your utilities bill and say, well, you know, I'm going to pay you a percentage of this because that's what I think is right. I only made a percentage on a trade today, so I'm only going to pay you. A per that's not how it works. They have a specific amount of money you owe them. That's business. So know the number that you're willing to risk and acknowledge it and accept it before you enter the trade. Yes, 
that trade I'm risking $500 and I'm willing to risk $500 on that trade. Because if you can't say that, you're always going to be emotional, right? I did this trade the other day. It was a 15 minute, it was an intraday trade. Rightway options folks were there. You could acknowledge this if you, you were there in the class. I did this 15 minute trade and really quickly we were up 20%. A lot of people in the room jumped out with just or I mean 10% just jumped out. They made 10% by following me, but I stayed with the trade because I'd put a stop loss in. I told, showed everybody where the stop loss is was I stayed with the trade. It was a 15 minute chart. I was expecting this to just move on down and do quickly move through, but that's not what happened. As a matter of fact, I was is still in that trade almost at the end of the day when I finally closed that trade for better than 20%. Because I stuck to the rules. And here's the other thing that people just find absolutely amazing. I didn't stare at that chart. I put my stop loss in and then I did my job. I kept doing the other things I needed to do. I didn't stare at it. I followed it, but I didn't stare at it. It didn't consume my thoughts because I had a risk that I was willing to risk in the trade. And then I followed the position to a winning position, winning trade. It was a 15 minute trade that I expected to be really quick that took almost five hours to complete. Did that right in front of everybody the other day. Okay. The reason I was able to do that is I knew the risk, I acknowledged and accepted the risk, and I let the plan work. I knew from the get-go that the trade could be a loser. But the pattern had a high expectancy of winning, so I stayed with the plan. And you know, emotion is is extremely difficult for everyone, Chad. The only way you can conquer that is to have a set of rules that makes your trading mechanical, makes it business-like. You're making a business decision, not an emotional decision. Place your stop losses always based on the price of the chart, Robert. Are you Are you brand new to the group? Have you not heard any, you might be, I, I mean, you've not heard any of these things that we've talked about before. You base your stop loss on the price action of the chart. That's why I say when I look for my price pattern, stock is in a trend, the stock moves up, it pulls back, I wait for the buyers to step in, I enter only trades that give me a low risk to the entry. I am picky. It's not the perfect answer that says, well, you always place your stop just three decimal points below. The, that's not the way trading works. You've got to look at the chart and evaluate the trade and build a trading plan. And if you don't know what your tolerance to risk is, if you buy this here and you don't know what your tolerance to risk is, and this trade happens to be a $500 risk and there's no way you can take a $500 risk, then you have made a major mistake. But if you plan this trade and it fits, Maybe your tolerance is 150 bucks, and this trade is only going to require $125 of risk to your stop loss. That's your trade.
And you want to take that trade every time. Okay. But it's not some magic science thing that's it's that tells you perfectly where to set that set that stop loss. It's based on the price action of the chart. Uh, Jan, I've shown this a ton of times. Um, I use the tool on Thinkorswim. It's called the theoretical price model, so that I can kind of calculate if the stock moves down, you know, three dollars. What's my option going to be worth? And it it'll tell you. Okay, so how are you going to fix that as the business owner? Are we just going to use that as an excuse? Well, I don't have that tool, so I guess I'm just out of luck. Solve the problem, Jen. Okay. Find the tools. Yeah. There's thank you Ed for posting that. Do some research. Find the tools. You know what I did? I was first trading with Options Express. Which by the way, <laughs> and I first opened a Thinkorswim account back when it was Thinkorswim. I first opened a Thinkorswim account because I could use the tool to calculate my risk. I just had to fill out another account application. Big deal. Open up an account. Boom. There you go. Solve the problem. Anybody can do that. Open up an account on Thinkorswim. Download the software. Problem solved. Okay, but one thing we cannot do, and here's the other thing I'm going to tell you, Jen, if you find that trading through TC2000 does not have the tools that you need to be successful, you need to change. And I mean now, boom. This is your business. If they don't have the tools to help you get done what you need to get done, don't waste another minute there. Change. That's your job as the business owner. Make that move. Gone. See ya. Okay. Last on, on this list is to make sure that the potential reward is greater than the risk. The reason that's on there is I had a really bad habit <laughs> of putting on trades where I was actually risking more to my stop loss than the trade really had the potential to make to the next resistance level. Because I would be so focused on an indicator or so focused on a price um, or a candle pattern or something that just had to be a winning candle pattern, I wasn't recognizing the overall um, potential of the trade. And it took me a long time to figure this out. I don't know why it took me so long to figure this out. But it makes no good sense to put risk in money or risk money that you can't make at least that money back in the trade. So you guys know that one of the things that I do is I usually require when I put together a trade, it has to have the potential, not the guarantee, but the potential it could make double what I risk in the trade or I'm not going to trade it. 
I don't care how pretty the pattern is. I don't care what Jim Cramer says about it. I don't care if if Rick comes over here and tells me, man, you have got to try. I'm in this. You've got to trade this. No, if it doesn't fit my rules, I don't trade it. That's the discipline. Okay. That's the discipline. Staying with simple, easy trades to understand, following a simple plan, sticking with that plan, not micromanaging, second guessing, doing all kinds, you know, adding more indicators, trying to convince yourself of one thing or another. One thing that you um, you guys know in right way options that when people throw something out there as a prediction, I usually jump right on it. How do you know that? Because they don't. When you try to predict the market, you set yourself up for a failure. Stop doing it. Just follow the price action. Don't give me this, well, I need this to flush down to here, and I need this to happen, and if this would just cross over here, this would be a great... That's just garbage. Stop doing that to yourself. Okay? Now, a lot of you are going to be trying to apply the thinking behind everything that I've talked about today to this current market condition. Can you apply many of these rules to this current market condition, guys? And come out with a good trade plan? No, that's right. That's why I've not sent out a trade alert. People will complain, well, why hasn't there been a trade alert for a week? Well, look at the market. I can send you out a trade alert so you can lose money if that's going to make it better for you. Is that going to make you feel better? I'm not trading because I don't have an edge. I made one trade today. It was a 15 minute day trade. One trade. And I had no desire, I mean zero desire to make any other trades today because I had no edge. My job is to protect my business, make sure that when the edge returns, I'm there and ready to make money. Not to give money back to the market, trying to be a hero trading when I don't have an edge. Does that make sense, guys? And I know this sounds really, really harsh. And it's meant to, in a way, because if you don't talk to yourself as the boss, if you're not that tough boss on yourself, and you allow yourself to just continue to break rule after rule after rule, never following a plan, this is gonna sound even harsher. Then you're gonna get exactly what you deserve. That's right. Either you do it yourself or the market will do it for you. Okay. Really quickly, I'm going to run through, you know, Jesse Livermore, um, like I said, he was kind of a nutty dude. And you got to remember, he was back in the, you know, he was trading back in the day, you know, in the 20s. Um, 
you know, before the big crash, you know, one of his most famous trades is he was actually short the market. He was short the market during the, the, the Great Depression crash. That was one of his most famous trades. But he had a way of summarizing things that makes a lot of sense. And I'm just going to read to you just a few of his, his things that he, that he said. And, and what's interesting is put it back into the 1920s. And then, you know, how true it is still today. He said this in the 1920s. There's nothing new in Wall Street. The can't, there can't be because speculation is as old as the hills. Whatever happens in the stock market today has happened before and will happen again. That's true, isn't it? There's nothing new. It's how we deal with the actions and the price actions of, of the market that matters. You want to talk about cutting to the core of things? This was one of his rules. Buy rising stocks, sell falling stocks. Wow. How brilliant is that? Now, how many of you guys think that that has anything to do with the rules that I have? Always trade with the direction of the overall market. Only trade stocks moving in the direction of the overall market. Buy rising stocks. Sell falling stocks. Pretty simple, right? We make it complicated. Jesse Livermore said this back in the 20s. Do not trade every day of every year. True today. Why is it that we feel that we should, because we're sitting here, be forced to trade the market even when the market's not setting itself up for us? Here's his next rule. Trade only when the market is clearly bullish or clearly bearish. Do you suppose he traded every single day? He's one of the most famous traders in the world. Do you think he traded every single day with a statement like that? Trade only when the market is clearly bullish or clearly bearish. What do we see in the market right now? Is it clearly bullish or clearly bearish? Or is it just ugh, lots of uncertainty? And I'm not trying to put a label on it. I want you guys to put a label on it. What do you think it is? Only trade after the action of the market confirms your opinion of the proper time to enter. Only enter a trade after the price action, he just says action, after the action of the market confirms your opinion. Buy stocks that are at or near price support with a buy signal. Confirm the price action. This is a brilliant statement here. Continue with trades that show you a profit in trades that show you a loss. Isn't that mechanical though? If the trade continues to show you profit, stay with that trade, continue to trade that trend. If the trade is showing you a loss, get rid of it. Do more of what works less of what's not. In trades when it's clear that the trend you um, that you are profiting from is over. When the trend breaks, get out of the trade. 
Isn't that what we say? A trend stays a trend until it breaks? Never average losses. For example, buying more of a stock that has fallen. Never average losses. Still a good rule today. Don't become an involuntary investor by holding on to stocks whose price has fallen. You guys know what he means by that? Don't turn a short-term trade into a long-term investing trade because you didn't cut loose a losing trade. Yeah, they can't afford to close. Don't become an involuntary investor by holding onto stocks whose price has fallen. This one I love, and it's one of the reasons that I jump on folks that try to predict all the time. The quote says, markets are never wrong. Opinions often are. Your opinion about the market doesn't matter. Never has and it never will. What matters is what the price of the stock is doing now. Your opinion of what you think should happen is not consequential to anything. Trade what this chart tells you, not what you want it to be. Okay. Here's another great quote. I don't think this wasn't a rule. No trading rules will deliver a 100% profit. Meaning that the way, he, the way it's worded here back in the day is rules won't guarantee you that you're going to win every trade. There's no guarantee in the stock market, right? We have to be willing to accept losses. They're going to happen. We know that they're going to happen. And there's no perfect rule that per will prevent that. If you can't get comfortable with the idea that you will lose money, you will never make it as a trader. Because losing is a part of being a successful trader. You have, it's just, the, it's the way it is. You have to accept it. Never buy a stock because it has had a big decline from its previous high. How many of you have speculated, well, this stock has moved down so much, it's got to go up from here? Right? How many times have we warned about chasing stocks, either up or down? It's just as wrong in either direction to chase those trades and think that you can pick the bottom. All right, so just a few things. And you know, there's a lot more of those. Thanks for posting that, Bill. Um, there's a lot more things he said that are that are really good, and you guys might want to look into some of um, his his words, his sayings. Um, and well, here's here's one that I think is great. Patterns repeat. Why do patterns repeat in the market? Here's his answer: Patterns repeat because human nature hasn't changed for thousands of years. We do the same thing, right? We overbuy, and then the stock necessarily has to pull back. And then as it pulls back, we oversell. Okay? Because we follow that same pattern of fear and greed all the time. It drives the market back and forth. Okay? 
Round and bottom breakout trades. Yes, in a round and bottom breakout trade, the trade that I like to trade, I don't predict the round and bottom breakout. I want to see the stock break above the 50. I want to see it pull back and hold the 50. I want to see the 50 day moving average starting to turn up. Flattening out, starting to turn up. I usually, you usually won't catch me trading those round and bottom breakouts where the 50 day moving average is still diving. Because I expect if that is going on, we're going to move up real briefly and then we're going to head down there and test that for support. So I wait for proof that buyers are stepping in. Okay. Well, that's where that anticipation is, Bill. And that's that, oh my gosh, I'm going to miss out situation. I've shown you guys charts before where I've been in trades that have lasted multiple years. Trends that have lasted multiple years. Just take a look at Microsoft. When you look at trends like that, you have to understand that it doesn't matter what entry point you took as long as you took an entry that provided you low risk on the entry of the trade, that trade would have made you money. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this statement from people. Well, this stock has gone up for so long, it has to come up and come down. No, that is not true. There's nothing in the rule book that says that it has to come down. Stop trying to tell yourself that and just follow, wait for the next entry into the trade and follow the stock. Okay. Uh, Robert, you must be new here because if you don't think I, <laughs> I, I wrote the ebook on the volatility stop. <laughs> I have this whole series of videos on YouTube on the volatility stop. Yes, I use the volatility stop. <laughs> and, and welcome for being here. Thanks for being here. By the way, anybody here that's not on my, um, subscribed to my YouTube channel? I'm going to ask you guys a favor. If you're not subscribed to my channel, go over here and subscribe. Okay. Whoops. Don't don't subscribe to Jesse Livermore. I don't know how I picked that up. Go over here and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, yes, this replay will be posted on YouTube, T, when I get a chance to get that done. All of the videos there are free. There's tons of information on there. Make sure you're even checking the descriptions of the videos. I oftentimes will toss in things, you know, so for example, if you go onto my YouTube channel, if you go to the consistent profits video series, which is about the volatility stop, and you look in the description of the video, there's a download link there to download the ebook. You can download the ebook. From the ebook, there's download links in the ebook that tells you how to set the set up the volatility stop on TC2000 and also the code thanks to one of our members Steve Combs who wrote the code for Thinkorswim so you can install it on there. So there's tons of information. On the TC2000 videos, I put links in there for scan codes and things that you can use. How to find certain candle patterns. Okay, and it's all free. Don't ask anything of anybody there, but please make sure you subscribe to that. And when you watch a video, do me a favor and click that 
that thumbs up button and leave a comment. That helps the algorithm show these videos to more people so that we can reach more folks and try to help them in their trading. I truly appreciate that. Thank you very much for that. So everyone, I want to wish you all a great evening. I know this wasn't one of the most fun um, fun classes you've ever been to, but I honestly and truthfully think this is one of the most important things that you can do for your trading. Don't give this lip service. Don't glaze this over. Buckle down and do the work. Okay, and it will improve your trading. Okay. And I appreciate you guys so much for spending so much time here tonight listening to me gab on here for an hour and 45 minutes. Right. Thanks everyone for being here. I truly appreciate it. We'll catch you all bright and early tomorrow morning for the morning market prep video that'll be out before the market opens. Everyone take care.